Okay, uh, do you have a card? Um, if Mr. Nasty Cronin, I guess Tom Malayk Doris and Anna Don Leon there, and it's uh, also going to hear in Galif. Um, a fall to get you on seminar there, and often shraw leach the than vlian show. If you on the core all going, uh, ring the vlian the galair, I guess Tom the Xul Gamor, can toss new and ish, can ish, I guess or the horse there in Scalora, I guess in screen or Kelly nor Drucker, a kindling in you of own Montreal. So my name is Nessa Cronin. I'm a lecturer in Irish studies and the associate director of the Moore Institute at NUI Galway. And I'm very delighted to welcome you all today uh, to the final seminar of our seminar series in Irish studies um, uh, at the university. Um, we're delighted to have with us uh, two very special guests all the way from uh, Montreal, uh, Mo in Montreal in, in Quebec in Canada. Um, our first speaker is Kelly Nora Drucker, who is a writer and doctoral student at Concordia University's Humanities PhD programme. She's a research creation scholar working on the intersection between creative writing, oral history and memory studies and Irish studies, and will be the Michael Smith Foreign Studies Scholar at the Centre for Irish Studies at NUI Galway uh, next year. Her, uh, Kelly is a writer and an academic, and her first collection of poems uh, called Small Fires was awarded the uh, A.M. Klein Prize for Poetry um, and the Concordia University First Book Prize, and was also a finalist for the Grand uh, Prix du Livre de Montréal in 2016. Her poetry and creative nonfiction have appeared in journals in Canada, Ireland, New Zealand and, and Australia. Petit Feu, the French language translation of Small Fires by uh, Laurie Saint-Martin and Paul Gagné was published by Le Lézard Amoureux in 2018. Today, Kelly is with us, and we're delighted to have her. Um, she's going to talk about her research creation dissertation that opens up the Irish-Canadian immigrant story as told through the lens of her own family experience and the story of Nora Davin's journey from Shrewl in County Mayo to Montreal in 1928. Um, so, Kelly, over to you um, for, for your, your, uh, your paper. Sure. Thank you so much, Nessa. Can every can you hear me? Okay, is the audio all right? Okay, wonderful. So, hello everyone, and thank you so much for being here today. I'm really grateful to the Moore Institute for inviting me here as a guest speaker, and to the Center for Irish Studies at NUI Galway. Also to Dr. Nessa Cronin and Professor Dan Carey for welcoming me, and to my lead supervisor, Dr. Barbara Lawrence-Koski, who's here from Montreal to be our guest respondent. I had originally planned to come to NUI Galway in the spring of 2020, and then the pandemic hit. Um, I've bumped my research trip three times, so hopefully I'll be able to join you sometime in the coming academic year. So today I'll be introducing you to my dissertation in progress, Naming the Traces, Reconstructing an Irish Canadian Family Narrative of Emigration, Placemaking and Return. I'm gonna share a presentation with you. Okay, just one moment, have to make it large. get myself out of the way. Okay. There we go. So today I'd like to share with you some of the tools that I'm using to reconstruct my family story as it unfolds across four generations. The methods and theoretical lenses I'm working with as an interdisciplinary scholar in the humanities, as well as the artistic approach I'm taking as a creative writer enrolled in the research creation stream of my program. I'll follow this by taking you inside the project and sharing some pieces of my family story with you through excerpts of writing, a clip of an oral history interview, and family photographs. And the interview will be with my mother and uncle, who, as you'll see, are key protagonists in this story and without whom none of this work would be possible. So I'd like to thank my mother and uncle right away. And after that, we can open up the floor to our discussion. So to foreground today's presentation, I'd like to bring forth some questions right away that are at the heart of this project so we can keep them in mind as we think through the task of researching and writing about our family history. So the first one, on what narrative, mnemonic, and spatial scaffolding is an intergenerational family story built? I like to work with uh, this idea of scaffolding, of getting behind the scenes and seeing how a family history is actually constructed. So what are the stories told? 
How are they remembered? And how did certain spaces and places help to shape and contain that family story? And then secondly, how as writers and historians can we access the family memories that inform these stories and work to reconstruct the past despite the gaps and silences that are present in any family narrative? So what are the methods that we use for gathering the stories? And in my case, especially, how can an interdisciplinary and research creation approach help us to feel our way into some of the cracks in a story? those spaces of the unknown? And how do we handle those elements that might not want to be shared while also acknowledging and honoring their presence? So these are two questions that I'm not gonna say I've entirely answered yet, but I like to keep them close beside me as I'm working. So to introduce the project itself, Naming the Traces takes the form of an intergenerational family memoir written in four parts, each part loosely corresponding to a generation. It draws upon the fields of oral history and narrative, studies in space and place with a strong emphasis on place-based nonfiction writing, and then memory studies. And it's written in the form of narrative nonfiction in a style that blends, I would say, intimate ethnography and autobiography and place-based writing. The project focuses on my maternal line, beginning with my great-grandmother, Nora Davin, who was born in the village of Shrewl, County Mayo, Ireland in 1899. And we have very few pictures of her. So this is one when she's a little bit older, uh, looking quite settled in in Montreal. In 1928, in the company of her older brother, Michael, she sailed to Montreal via Liverpool and Quebec City. But while her brother continued on to the States, Nora remained in Montreal alone. There, several months later, she gave birth to my grandmother Rose at the Hôpital de la Miséricorde de Montréal, a Catholic-run home for unmarried mothers. The narrative then follows several generational strands of my family's emplaced memories in Montreal. From my grandmother Rose's upbringing in a series of downtown rooming houses, to my mother and uncle's childhood among the streets, laneways, and cold water flats of the traditionally working class neighborhood of Point St. Charles, the project concludes with a section that focuses on my own journeys to the west of Ireland as an adult. Here the project shifts from intimate ethnography to a mode closer to the autobiographical. Having grown up in rural Quebec, an, out, an hour outside of Montreal, I felt somewhat estranged from the Ireland that my great-grandmother knew and that my grandmother, who never had the chance to visit it in her lifetime, longed for. It was only after traveling to Ireland several times as an adult that I came to understand that despite what Lorette Savoy calls the estranging power of displacement, connection with a place can be remade and established anew. A family story told across several generations accounts for a giant swath of material, so I felt that I needed an organizing principle. As a structural device, I chose to model my project after this image of the Celtic knot of journey and return, which my uh, professor Susan Cahill and I came upon online one day, um, for it spoke to me of the four phases of my family's story that I would like to tell. This four-pointed knot bound by a circle at its center, suggests that the stories of individuals are also intertwined with the stories of others in the family. In this project, they are held together by a central narrative voice, my own, that seeks to trace the ways that story, memory, and place play out in each generation. Naming the Traces is an interdisciplinary project, and each of my three fields proposes different ways of approaching a family story, different ways of listening and seeing. I will share with you now some of the key concepts and questions that each of my fields has raised. So from the first one, oral history and narrative, Oral history interviews with family members form the backbone of my project, and around these, I'm in the process of researching the historical context in which each generation of my family has lived. But working in this field raises some issues. So the first one I'd like to, to bring up uh, by Alessandro Portelli, oral history tells us less about events than about their meaning. 
So this is one of the ways that oral history is sort of a different approach to doing history. Uh, while we are concerned with what happened, of course, we're also concerned with how it happened, how it felt, and how it affected the individuals. So we're able to access through oral history a sort of different qualitative quality of history. From Paul Thompson, oral history can give back to the people who made and experienced history through their own words a central place. And I find this really important for groups uh, or families or individuals who have been underrepresented. Um, oral history can really be a place for them to have their say. And it's also lovely when they've taken part in interviews and then they're able to be part of the dissemination of that story and have a say in how that goes out in the world, be it through a database, a film, um, or an essay like mine. And then Michael Frisch's concept of sharing authority, that's been an important part of my training at Concordia University at the Center for Oral History and Digital Storytelling. Um, Frisch believes, as do many oral history historians, that we need to allow interviewers to lead the interview and to have both parties meet, uh, each having their authority in, in their subject matter, uh, each being strongly based in their knowledge, but both parties coming together to really focus on what the interviewee has to say. In my project, I'm also really foregrounding my role as both interviewer and daughter, niece and cousin. So I'm really approaching this, this work as both. Um, right now I'm in the process of applying for ethics at my university to continue the interview process. And that's a really important part where you get to see the, the impact that sharing your, somebody else's story can have and just how sensitive and, and delicate it is. Um, but then within my family itself, we also have our own ethics and we check in with each other about comfort level. Um, my family, I'm ex extremely close to my family and our dynamic is very important to me. So along the way, uh, I find it really important to be checking in as the project progresses. And then in terms of methodology, conducting different types of interviews for different purposes. So in my project, I've conducted walking interviews with my mother, Nora Maynard, and my uncle, Robert Maynard, through Point St. Charles, where they grew up. And that's a really wonderful way to access on-site memories where the environment, as you're walking through a neighborhood, the environment itself is stimulating recall. And I was able to catch that all with my audio recorder. The intergenerational interview or family group interview is a really interesting technique as well because you get to see the way that family members build memory together. And then the one-on-one -on -one sitting interview is really the chance to, to listen in deeply to one person and possibly send them the questions in advance so that they really have time to reflect on the story. So for my second field, tracing the importance of place in an intergenerational family story. Tim Cresswell has this notion of space and place. And for him, a space is a, pl um, a place is a space made meaningful by human interaction with it. So I'm interested in this idea in my family story of, of placemaking. How has each generation arrived in a place, be it um, a new city, be it in terms of my great grandmother, the Hôpital de la Miséricorde, or a neighborhood or an apartment building? And how have they worked to make that place into their own, to adapt to it, to affect that place, and also be affected by it? And then a lovely idea that I found in Kent C. Ryden's work, this notion of the invisible landscape. Um, according to Kent C. Ryden, there is an unseen layer of usage, memory, and significance of imaginative landmarks superimposed upon the geographical surface. So according to Ryden, when people have lived in a place for a long time, or when they know it well, when they're tied to it, they see it differently than others who do not. So for them, when they look at a place, they are seeing the layers of time and the layers of memory that are, that are uh, superimposed upon it. So as I walked with my mom and uncle through Point St. Charles, I was really able to see this invisible landscape in, in action. And I felt privileged to be able to access it because if you don't know the stories, you can't see the landscape. But once you receive the stories, you start seeing an old vacant lot or an old building quite differently. And then a third idea that's important to me from Simon Shama, this notion of using the archive of the feet to explore a place. So for Shama, the archive of the feet is trusting 
being present in a place, walking, actually being there, paying attention to what the landscape tells us, um, what physical markers are there of past events, but then also being attentive to reading the landscape for its absences and what is not there, who is not represented, what, is, what has been destroyed or taken away, what is missing. And then also trusting our gut and our intuition. Uh, in his own work, Shama ends up finding a, um, a Jewish burial ground that was neglected and forgotten simply on a, a hunch. So I found that very compelling. And then my third field, memory studies. Alexander Freund has a wonderful uh, notion of communicative interaction that I've really seen come into play in my project. He observes how family memories are retold and renegotiated during group interviews or conversations. So rather than um, this notion that family memories are static entities that are handed down intact and that sort of don't shift over the generations. Freund disagrees with that and says that memory is something that's fluid, that's constantly in the process of being renegotiated. And when he in recorded some intergenerational interviews, he was able to watch as family members sort of negotiated the memory, building it together, adding to the story, sometimes working to harmonize, to, to come up with the same memory, and then sometimes having their own take on it. And this is a phenomenon I've really seen uh, come into play in my own family interviews. And then this question, how do families treat absences or silences in a family story? And by what means can we respectfully probe the boundaries of those silences? And for this question, I've really turned to other writers. Sharon O'Brien has a wonderful intergenerational family memoir um, in an, involving an Irish American family called the, the Family Silver. And in it, she traces depression through several generations of her family and this notion of emotional closure and shutting down. And she traces it actually back to the famine and eviction and this idea that we can lose anything in an instant. And she describes this as an emotional inheritance in her family. That's something I found fascinating. And then Marion Hirsch's notion of post memory, wherein memories that are extremely traumatic are sometimes transferred to the generation after so that it inhabits the generation after as if it is their own memory, but it is transmitted in a way that is not always spoken. So it can come through in somebody's body language, in their gestures, in nightmares, in um, tension, in things that are half sent spoken, sentences that trail off. So this is a notion that came out of Holocaust studies, and I don't want to appropriate it uh, to my family story, but I would use this as a jumping off place to look at how memory is transferred uh, in an unspoken way. And then a final question, what impact can archival material and uncovering further details of family stories have on memory and identity? So I think this is some of uh, something that many of us experience as we're researching our family story, we're learning about it, we're uncovering new things, and what effect does that have on how we see ourselves and remember ourselves? Some interesting shifts in identity can happen. So those are my three fields. Um, I also wanted to bring to the table this notion of research creation, which I know in different places is referred to as different things. Um, it can be arts-based research or practice-led research. And within um, artistic disciplines, I'm sure it happens very differently. I'm practicing it as a creative writer. Uh, so I'll speak a little bit about how it works for me. Uh, for me, it's about accessing and disseminating different types of knowledge. So what can we gain through um, writing about something creatively that we might not be able to gain if we didn't? So I have this question here. What can we learn from a description of 30 layers of wallpaper? Um, in one of the um, pieces of my family history project, my uncle is describing this wall in a kitchen that my family had that was layered thick with all these layers of wallpaper and how the children were constantly told, don't touch the wall, don't touch the wall. Um, and in, in conveying that to me and then in me narrating that in my family story, um, we actually learn quite a lot about this family. I mean, we could approach it from a different perspective and, and learn about what the father's yearly income was and how much the rent was. But if we want a, sort of a, the, the textures and colors of, of the situation, 
um, we can learn from this passage that the family was probably not very wealthy, but were house proud and were interested in having a neat, clean kitchen, um, that the children were boisterous and, and busy and were sort of getting into trouble. So just through, through these small snippets um, of description, you can actually learn a lot about a family. And then this notion of learning through creative practice, so learning through doing. Uh, I strongly believe that I don't quite know what I know about something until I write about it. And it's it's in the writing about it that I get to make connections um, between my own work and other people's work and, and know what I'm actually thinking. And then for me, it's also important to have a creative process that's informed by research and engagement with other thinkers. So um, keeping my practice as a creative writer but then informing it with uh, the works of other writers and using theory, uh, some of the ones I just shared with you, as a lens through which I can then reflect on and interpret my family story and see it differently. And for those of you who are interested in research creation, I found a wonderful article by Owen Chapman and Kim Sawchuk called Research Creation, Intervention Analysis and Family Resemblances. And I can put that in the chat for you as well. So now I'd like to share with you some excerpts from my family story um, in the form of writing, photographs, and interview clips. I'll say that sections, uh, the introduction, sections one and two of my project are well on their way. So I'm mostly going to share with you from those. Sections three and four I'll touch upon briefly at the end, but those are sections that are really still in the pro, uh, process of being formed, and it'd be interesting to hear your feedback um, on those at the end in the question period. So I'm going to share with you um, the opening of my project. And it finds me in 2017, standing outside the Hôpital de la Miséricorde de Montréal, where my great grandmother gave birth to my grandmother. And when I visited this building, I was, first of all, it was, it was kind of incredible that I had never visited it before. I didn't grow up in Montreal, but I lived there for many years as an adult. And I had never thought to go down and see this place. So I arrived at the building, which is now abandoned. And as I stood in front of it, I had these reflections and I was thinking about it really as a threshold, sort of a crossing over place um, in which, you know, my gran was born, the first generation was born on Canadian soil and a place that my great grandmother had to endure. Thresholds. Etched into a pane of glass on the western entrance of the original building on René Lévesque, I can see the words Sœur de la Miséricorde still plainly visible, the wavy font speaking of another time. The glass on this pane must have shone free of the car exhaust that now dusts its surface when my great grandmother, when my grandmother Rose was born here, one February day, 88 years ago. This is the same lettering that Nora would have seen as she first approached the building the day she checked in. Though as a recent immigrant from the west of Ireland, the French would likely have been foreign to her. As a third generation Montrealer, now fluent in French, I stand here reading it and wondering how she felt as she climbed the front steps and knocked before being escorted across the doorway's threshold. I took some photos when I was on site. So this is the glass above the entrance and you can still see faintly Sœur de la Miséricorde inscribed into the glass. And um, given that it looks so old, I thought that this is quite possibly the original lettering that she would have seen. So it was quite haunting. I'm now going to read to you from the first section of the project, Normal Exceptions. So this project, um, this section begins with tracing my great grandmother's story. Um, I'm aiming to reconstruct a little bit about what her life was like in Shrule before she left. So there's lots of research I still have to do that I hope to be able to do when I come to Galway sometime this year. And then tracing the circumstances that led up to her immigration. Um, looking at the journey by boat, what that would have been like, and then soon after arriving at the Miséricorde, giving birth to her daughter alone, and then somehow 
um, my mom believes through records that she's found um, that a cousin came up from the States and actually gave Nora some money so that she was able to leave the Misericorde with her daughter. Because in this home for unmarried mothers, mothers had to work for up to six months to pay off their stay. Um, and it's also important to say a lot of mothers did not leave with their children. It, adoption was strongly encouraged. And as a lot of the mothers were on their own and worked as um, domestics or uh, live in jobs, they were not able to keep their babies. So my grandmother was actually able to keep my grandmother, which is quite remarkable. And then she went on to raise her um, as a single mother in Montreal. My grandmother's father was not known to her and um, he, never, he never came back to Montreal. So my great grandmother was on her own. I'm gonna share with you this photo. This is one of the rare photographs that we have um, of my grandmother as a child. So you can see her at around the age four or five. And then my great grandmother is the woman in black. And in this photo, she's standing with two unknown women. Um, so when I look at this photo, it gives me clues into how she might have survived as a single mother. Um, was she part of a community of women? Did she make friends um, at the church or through one of her jobs? Did she have help with childcare? These are some of the questions I'm asking, but it's quite comforting to see her here, not alone and surrounded by, uh, by two women. So I'm going to share with you an excerpt from this section. Where Great Granny differs from many Irish Catholic immigrants of her generation is that she began her new life in Montreal as a single mother. Lindsay Erner Byrne uses the term normal exception coined by Sigurd der Gylfi Magnusson to describe a historical instance in which a person is living simultaneously both a normal and an exceptional circumstance. In Great Granny's case, she was one of many young Irish immigrants earning her living in Montreal through menial work, but she was doing so while living outside of the moral and social boundaries determined for her by both the Catholic society she had left and the one to which she had immigrated. That she was able to hold on to her daughter Rose and raise her to be a woman who raised three children of her own, one of whom raised me, is a testament to her strength, her will, and her love of the infant who the dominant forces in her society told her she should not keep. And here's one last image of the Misericorde. When I was standing in front of it, um, you can see that I'm standing in front of a gate and I'm looking into the inner courtyard. And I was looking at those windows, the upper ones uh, were probably the dormitory windows and just wondering which one was hers. Um, did she look out of one of those windows? So this is an instance where Simon Shama's notion of the archive of the feet is really quite important to be able to walk around a place and get a feel for it. And to have that complement the, the historical, the archive research and the reading of secondary sources. So these are all elements that I'm putting together in my project. So now I'm moving into part two, the Maynard family in Point St. Charles. So this part of the project is the longest so far. And it's largely built uh, from a walking interview I conducted with my mother and uncle, Bob, um, Robert Maynard, but I call him Bob, through Point St. Charles in 2015. And this is a good example of shared authority with my mom and uncle leading the way in the interview. I had provided them with some loose questions beforehand, but um, they together really planned out uh, the itinerary for our interview. So what we did is we walked through the neighborhood where they had grown up from the 50s until the mid 60s. And um, we, we stopped at each place that they had lived, but in chronological order. So as we stopped at each place, you could see the children almost growing up in front of you. My mom's memory is getting more and more vivid because she's the youngest. So she was quite little when they lived in the first place in Point St. Charles. Um, so this part of the project is, is quite literally a narrative reconstruction of that walking interview. So in this image, I just wanted to draw your attention. This is my mom at a, around the age of 10. And at this point, the family had left Point St. Charles. My grandparents had split up. 
Uh, my grandmother was raising her three children by herself, but she was likely coming back to Point St. Charles on this day to visit her father. So she's a little bit dressed up. And uh, she's standing in what my family calls Mullins Park, which the map calls Parc Saint-Gabriel. But uh, another thing I draw attention to in my project is the way that families map landscapes and they name them. They have their own names for things, which is, I guess, part of the ima um, imagined landscape. So this is an excerpt from, um, this is a photo taken from the walking interview taken by my brother, Jesse Drucker, to whom I'm very grateful for these photos. And uh, while we were walking along Knox Street, my mother just stopped and you can see from her expression, this sort of glee and excitement as a memory came up. And she recalled this stoop as being very similar to a stoop that she had um, walked on as a little child. And as we're standing here, you can see my uncle is in black, his back is to us, my mom is in white, and then I'm there in burgundy with my little handheld recorder. My mom is telling us about uh, one of her earliest memories of walking back and forth, pacing anxiously on a stoop like this. She wanted to go off and play with her friends, but she was worried about uh, worrying or displeasing her mother who was inside. So this photo is, holds an example of the way that a place can really just ignite this spontaneous recall and have memories come up that might not have come up had we not visited the place. So I'm gonna play for you an audio clip that might take me a little second to get, uh, to get set up, but uh, just to set the scene for you, this is a condo complex on Knox Street. And as we were walking along, my uncle realized that the original building that the family had lived in had been knocked down and this condo had been put up. But as we were standing looking at it, my uncle and mom remembered that, I guess you can see sort of an opening. It looks like a driveway that you can drive through to a car park in the back. Well, my uncle remembered that there used to be a junkyard behind there. And we didn't end up crossing the threshold for fear of, you can actually see a sign above it and it's a do not enter privacy sign. We were afraid of, you know, trespassing. I sort of wish we had, but in a way it's fun that we hadn't because the memory of the junkyard remains intact in that way. So just going to see how I can share this audio clip with you. Asleep in the junkyard. Oh. You know, they've been closed for the weekend, so okay. we always went in, you know, whatever. We had our picnic, no shirt. I had a terrible sunburn. Okay. And my back, I had... Uh, Listers. No, uh, ant bites. Oh. Raised ant bites the size of plums. Oh. My whole back, oh my you know, it was like unbelievable. The uh, red ants. From falling asleep in the yeah, junkyard. Yeah. yeah. Not the Riviera. No. But that's the thing. If, you know, you played with what you had. Yeah, I yeah. mean, again, to point out that the parks down here were squares with a couple of benches in them, but they didn't have playground equipment for kids. Now, there were probably a few that did, yeah. but it didn't last. Yeah. Kids were rough down here. You know, I mean, the, the seesaws got broken. The swings were, you know, taken apart. And, you know, but a lot of the parks, if you will, were little squares. They were little, you know, for with benches, with pigeons and, you know, little pieces of grass. We played in them, but we mostly played in the lanes and on the streets and in the backyards or the sheds or the junkyards. It's more interesting. You know, it's more interesting. Yeah. For kids, that's your, yeah, uh, lanes were cool. you know, yeah. it's not unlike a, a ch you know, a toddler on the floor of the kitchen who prefers pots and pans to, to you know, a Fisher-Price toy. Well, you Okay, so I just want to be absolutely certain that you heard that audio clip. I'm sorry, it's difficult with the transition. Could somebody, Nessa, perhaps let me know that you heard it? Yeah, it sounded great. Thank you. Ah, okay, mm -hmm. wonderful. Good, good to hear mm -hmm. that we're all together. Okay, good.
So I'm now going to share with you an excerpt from the text that follows um, just what you heard. So we're standing in front of the building still on Knox Street. As I stand looking at the gray building and the tracks behind, I can't see how there was enough room for a junkyard behind them. My mother and uncle explain that the buildings did not go as far back as these present day ones do. They tried to reconstruct the scene for me. Pacific Street opened up onto the junkyard and the back of the junkyard was fenced off from the railroad tracks. The old buildings were only one flat deep and had an exterior shed attached to the back, off of which there was a fire escape that led to a muddy backyard. The junkyard behind was a small one containing discarded refrigerators, old car parts, scrap metal. My mother stresses that landlords were not too invested in laying down sod to make yards. Their clientels were renters, often poor and transient. Again, I have the feeling of temporal realities existing side by side, the adult's perspective directly followed by the child's. That the landlords didn't care about the places they owned did not seem to impinge upon my uncle and mother's ability to make full use of them. This was their playground. As my mother said during our one-on-one -on -one interview, they had their imaginations and each other and they could run free and explore. When I asked my uncle if the sound of the train passing today is louder or quieter than he remembers it being, he answers, the same. This is the only thing that would put me to sleep, the sound of the trains going by. And here we have an image captured by my brother of the trains going by. So this moment marked a beautiful uh, continuity between the past and the present with the sound of the train being a constant backdrop. So those are the pieces of my project that are the most developed. I'm gonna move into section three uh, where I'm going to focus on my grandmother, Rose, um, who is very much uh, the mortar of the family, the person that, that kept everyone together when times got tough. Um, I'd like to look at possibly objects that were important to Rose. She had a, a songbook of songs that she collected. She liked to sing and play guitar when she was younger. And I'd like to look at these at objects from her life um, as she aged and progressed and sort of build a portrait around uh, that. But this section of the project will be different again and quite personal because I was close to my grandmother. She lived with us um, in an apartment attached to our house when I was growing up. So it's quite close. And I'm going to experiment with addressing part of this project to her directly. So as, as a you speaking right to my grandmother. So this is her as a young mother with my mom and my second cousin, Kevin in Point St. Charles. And then this is a photo I just thought was interesting because it's very likely taken by my grandmother. And you could see these, pers these people that she was close to and in some ways responsible for. That's her mother, Nora Davin, who's older in this photo. And then my mom at the bottom looking like a adorable little sprite. And then my uncle Bob in the middle. And then my uncle Ed, who I haven't interviewed for this project, um, but I might still, we'll see. Um, so, it's interesting to think about not only what's in the photo, but what and who is outside of the photo and, and why. Um, so to me, this is also a portrait of uh, a busy working mom uh, who's taking this photo of her family. And then the last section of my project um, is going to depend largely on if I'm able to go to Ireland or not, but it's looking more and more possible with vaccinations uh, happening all over the world. But I plan to uh, return to Shrule, or actually I should say visit Shrule for the first time in the company of my mother. And what we planned to do was learn as much about it as possible before we go, sort of lay a lot of groundwork, um, and then walk through the village together and do a walking interview, but really more of a recorded conversation between the two of us. And I would be open to interviewing people there as well who might know about um, the history of the village or, perhaps the circumstances that families like Nora's would have been living under. And there's also going to be a part of this last section where I reflect upon my own travels to Ireland as an adult. Um, this picture is taken from uh, on the island of Inishmore. And uh, it's, I have a sign here in the Irish language, um, because this, 
Inishmore also represents my first real introduction to the Irish language. My great grandmother spoke both Irish and English at home. Uh, once she came to Montreal, my mom has said that she heard a little bit of Irish, but that she didn't pass it on to her family. A lot of the people around her didn't speak it. And then as Anglophone Quebecers, we've also as a family gone on to speak French. So there's kind of a linguistic shift that happens. Um, so, but these last two pieces of the project are very much in progress and I'm excited about getting started on them in the months to come. So I'll end there. And I wanna thank everyone for listening. And now we can open up the floor to our discussion. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Kelly. Um, that was absolutely fantastic. And it was great to hear kind of more about your project from, from when we were last in touch as well. Um, if you want to keep your screen on, but you can put, keep your, um, your mic off maybe just for the next section. Um, we're delighted to have Dr. Barbara Lawrence-Koski with us here today. Um, Barbara is a cultural historian of North America based at the Department of History at the University of Concordia in Montreal. Um, her book, Sounds of Ethnicity, Learning to, Listening to German North America, 1850 to 1914, um, examines uh, and uses the exercise of historical eavesdropping that examines public conversations on ethnicity and modernity, community and nation, public culture and transnationalism through the history of spoken language and popular uh, musical life. Um, she's also involved in a current project uh, entitled The Children's War, which is a large scale oral history study that draws upon the life course stories of about 80 women and men who came of age in the seaport cities of St. John's in Newfoundland and Halifax, Nova Scotia during the years of the Second World War. Um, so her, her areas of, of, of uh, research in terms of the social spaces of childhood um, and also the kind of the cultural history and the micro histories associated with migrant and transnational identities um, um, make her the perfect respondent for the session today, but also as well as um, an academic mentor as well to, uh, to Kelly's work. So Barbara, over to you for um, just observations uh, here for, for, for the discussion today. Thank you so much, Nessa, for these kind words of welcome, and also for having extended this wonderful invitation um, to Kelly and um, myself both today. Um, Kelly is a doctoral student in Concordia's PhD Humanities program, which is a program that allows students to really create their own PhD trajectory, kind of having a multidisciplinary thesis committee with three faculty members all working in different areas. This is a program that attracts um, highly independent, highly motivated students whose work is always drawn to reach beyond disciplinary boundaries. And Kelly is no exception. She's the rare graduate student who's both an exquisite writer with a poet's sensibility and imagination and a rigorous scholar. And I got to know Kelly shortly before she published her first book of poetry that won several prizes. And it was my pleasure to go to a poetry reading where Kelly would first preface each of these poems with a little story that took us to the genesis, the neology of this poem, then read from the poem. And I'll always remember the contented sighs that were rippling through the audience before Kelly was turning to the next um, poem on her list. Um, recently presented together in Sydney, Australia at a conference. And again, Kelly's two identities that both a scholar and a poet were very much intertwined after presenting at the conference. She then went on to several poetry readings. Um, in my comments this morning, I just thought I would kind of highlight three major interventions that in my reading Kelly contributes um, to several fields of scholarships. And these interventions in my reading are first her work in playing with scales of analysis. Second, the collaborative ethos that imbues her work. And third, her really innovative contributions to the ways we can marry childhood and family stories more generally. To speak to the first point, playing with scales, in my own field, the field of history, um, I would probably think of Kelly's work as a global microhistory. It is at a first glance an intimate memoir of four generations of her own family, yet in its analytical reach and literary reach it's a far more ambitious work and what allows Kelly to make her work speak to larger claims 
is her rigorous use of 3UE from several different fields. And I think what was really always evocative in your presentation, Kelly, is your use, for instance, of in-placed storytelling. Um, secondly, a second major contribution my reading of Kelly's work is the collaborative ethos that imbues it. And you just got, uh, as an audience, a taste of this today. This collaborative ethos is at work at several different levels. Um, the first chapter of Kelly's work, Novel Exceptions, is very much a joint effort of both Kelly and her mother to piece together the life of your great grandmother from these very few traces that have been left behind in the archival record. And I'm reminded here of Carolyn Stevens' wonderful phrase that the work of the story is to conjure up whole social systems from a nutmeg grater. And this is very much a work that you're kind of undertaking here. Part of this collaborative ethos, and this is something we often reflect on in Concordia's Center for Oral History and Digital Storytelling, is an ethos that has us learning with, rather than learning about the people whose life we, their lives we study. And we saw this again in action here, Kelly, in the walking interview you shared that you had conducted with your mother and uncle. And part of this um, commitment to working collaboratively means that we have to think about how to navigate the telling of difficult stories. Being part, a member of a family, at times will mean that you know more, that you're at liberty to share, that you're comfortable to share. You have to work with silences surrounding certain family stories. You have to respect these silences, maybe sometimes hint at them, gesture at them. And that's also, I think, um, one of the many ways your work contributes to larger fields of scholarship. And then the third intervention your work makes, um, Kelly, is that it's yet another model on how we can arrive at ways of narrating childhood and narrating um, family stories. I should add that Kelly and I together organized an interdisciplinary working group that was entitled Narrating Childhood that met several times over the course of a year, its members again hailing from different disciplinary areas, where we all were keen to write family memoirs of a kind, and we were all working through the narrative forms that would best befit the stories we were kind of hoping to tell. Um, and to just point to some of the contributions you make in this larger umbrella of narrating childhood, um, your work very much integrates the process of doing research into your telling of the story. It was very visible in the excerpt you shared with us today um, from the walking interview in Point Saint-Charles. It is also clearly at work when you write about your great-grandmother's life and normal expectations, when your mother's voice too is being folded into this process of piecing together this family story. Um, it is truly a work of creative nonfiction. Again, I always remember how Kelly once said to me that my first language is poetry. And so really in this dissertation, you're working your second language, the language of prose. And yet in your easy slippage between time worlds, I think you're very much drawing on examples we have from the worlds of fiction. That's something that the old historian Alessandro Portelli has called shuttle work that carries us between the narrative now, now when you're working with your your mother and your uncle thinking back to these stories to the worlds remembered and sometimes even perhaps to the worlds that have never been the worlds that your great grandmother must have imagined and envisioned as she was embarking on this journey um, and then lastly and I'll keep my comments um, brief so that there's a lot of time for question and answer this experimenting with narrative forms and narrative voice that as you were saying today you're hoping perhaps to tell the third chapter, your grandmother's story through objects of memory and that you're at least for now thinking about ways to experiment with your narrative voice by addressing the third chapter directly to your grandmother. 
In short, it's a wonderful project as a supervisor that has just been a privilege being involved in this journey. And I am learning at least as much as I hope to maybe be able to share with Kelly. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, thank you so much, Barbara, for that. It um, was a, a wonderful way of, I think, framing um, a, a response uh, across three different areas. Um, Kelly, would you like to respond to anything from Barbara? And we'll also maybe have a look at some of the questions that have been coming in as well uh, with regard to your work. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to say what a privilege it is to be mentored by you, Barbara. Barbara has been with me since the beginning of this PhD journey, and I could not have asked for um, a better mentor. And it's really um, heartening to hear my work spoken about in an overview. Uh, sometimes I'm, I don't see the forest, I see the trees. I'm very focused on the trees, I think, as a, as a poet. So it's really, it's really helpful to see um, my work spoken about in a, in a broad, broader framework. And I, I wrote down a phrase, worlds that have never been, which is something I have not thought about adding to my project, but um, I took that to mean, what are the possible worlds that my great grandmother might have imagined for herself? What are those, what are those paths that people walk down that were blocked and that were, it was not actually possible to continue down? And I've circled that as being something that I have not really included in my project yet that's a really exciting opening so thank you so much for that and and for all of your comments great um I might just ask you a couple of um questions Kelly just uh, and this is uh, as well from uh, comments that have been coming in from the chat uh, in particular uh we have one here from uh, Jackie Kiona who's listening in on Facebook to us um, she says, as an oral historian, I was wondering if there are any points so far in your research where the documentary historical record has contradicted the oral history memories of your family. Um, and if so, what did any such discrepancies reveal? So I suppose look at the official history versus the unofficial or the, the narrative history of your family. That's a, that's a really great question, Jackie. Um, there was one small one that I can think of right now where um, the gray nuns had come had come up um, in my family story, and then as I was reading about it, I, at the Miséricorde, I learned that it was run by the Sœur de la Miséricordia. But I have to look more deeply into that because I'm I'm not that familiar with the different the different orders. Um, but I think it's a really important question because there there are those two things. There are, are what what happened, what are the facts, and then how are they remembered and passed down. So I think there's going to be a process in my work of gathering the stories, and then reading about the context, and then working to sort of check the facts and maybe point out, because it could be an interesting point of entry to see a place in the project where there is a discrepancy, but then look at why. Because um, as, as Portelli says in oral history, sometimes a family story is more about what we wanted to have happened um, or what we imagine to have happened. So those can be really intriguing openings. Mm -hmm. yeah. That brings up a really, a really lovely observation that Barbara made as well too. Um, and you had flagged it at the beginning about the, first of all, there's the, the, the ethics part of your research, which is something that, you know, we all have to be very mindful of and careful to manage um, appropriately and sensitively when we're dealing with any research in this area. But then you have the added layer of, of that in terms of it's also looking at your own family history as as well so there's the the ethics and um, of of managing that uh, at that personal level as well as the professional level as well um and have you found any other case studies or any other approaches about how to manage that or how to navigate those two kinds of sets of ethical kind of questions um in your work or maybe barbara has come across some of this as well too so Kelly, have you how how are you managing with that, or how you you were talking about the whole, the whole process, the whole research process with your family as well? It's almost like a kind of a knowledge co-creation in a way, as well as a research creation kind of dissertation that you're kind of creating the memories together. I think is is what you said. Yeah, I can't I can't seem to think of any case studies that come to mind immediately. I'm sure there are some that I've read, but I can't seem to think. Yeah, of no, any. no worries. Because sometimes it can be hard to when you're working through something to, to find something else somewhere else can be very useful as well. You know, mm -hmm. um, Barbara, have you have you come across anything like that before in terms of what Kelly is looking at in your own work in terms of navigating the ethical questions of oral history, but then also doing it from the insider perspective in terms of, a, I suppose, an ethnographic approach as well? 
Thinking back, Kelly, to this wonderful reading course we undertook together with Eleni, mm -hmm. where we were kind of looking at Annette Kuhn's Family Secrets and also Carolyn Steedman's Landscape for Good Women. Mm -hmm. And even though the kind of family relationships you're describing are quite different in character in terms of a work that at times almost feels a bit like a collage, kind of even the brief excerpts you shared with us today, there were the scenic descriptions of the places you were inhabiting right now, the stoop you were standing on in Point Saint-Charles, and then kind of looking through this um, driveway into this junkyard of yesteryear, kind of that came alive so vividly in memory, I think kind of these works might provide models perhaps for your own. For I still remember how you walked into your meeting and said, these must have been like the two most important books I read in the past decade. And these might be kind of interesting works perhaps to turn to. Mm. Just saw a message there from Rachel Andrews, who's one of our um, graduate uh, scholars as well in our studies. And she said, she's, I wonder, have you heard of Memory of Memory by Maria Stepanova? She brings up a lot of these questions in her book as well. So that might be a useful okay. reference we can follow up on. Um, just another question, actually, as well, that uh, appeared um, uh, as well. Uh, in terms of looking at the, the Irish North American connection. Um, and this is from Eric Bustead uh, from the US. Um, and he's saying, uh, what has it been like navigating various cultures in the process? So the kind of the intercultural dialogue and has there been any resistance to a formal process? Um, I'm as an American just starting to build relationships from scratch with the lost family in Mayo in Ireland as well too. So, um, so any, how, how has it been for you Kelly navigating the Irishness and the Mayo-ness uh, with the Montreal. <laughs> um, well, we we don't actually have any relatives in County Mayo that we're still in touch with. My mm -hmm. great grandmother um, maintained ties through letter writing for a little while, and then those faded off. So I would actually be entering. Uh, I've never been to Shul. I, I've I. Um, it's quite amazing that I have never been because I've spent a lot of time on Inishmore, but I think my interest in the family story and even our knowledge about where she came from in Mayo has just come out over the years through a lot of these records that have been made available on Ancestry.com. Because my great grandmother was quite private and she actually didn't talk that much about her life in Ireland. So those relationships that I make will be, uh, will be brand new. Um, I have spent quite a bit of time living on Inishmore and it was really my first introduction to the Irish language. I actually heard it for the first time when I was there in 2001. And um, it's been absolutely incredible, just an, an adjustment to realizing that, you know, we've, my family has lived, we're, we live in Quebec, but we're Anglophone. We live almost entirely in English, but to think that an entire cultural lineage in my family has been speaking Irish and that that came across with my great grandmother, but that it didn't, it didn't have enough of a hook or a root uh, in in her new in the new place that she lived in to sort of blossom mm -hmm. and for her to pass it on to her children. I mm -hmm. think that's been one of the the um, most eye opening things. And Nessa, actually, when I was defending my uh, dissertation proposal, brought up a wonderful question about being attentive to languages in my project. Even though I'm an English speaker, I'm writing in English. To opening the door to letting. Um, wherever appropriate, letting Irish in, letting French in. A lot of the records that I'll be looking through um, for the Hôpital de la Miséricorde, because there's one in Montreal, but also one in Quebec City, those will be almost entirely in French. So yes. even though I'm disseminating the project in English, just really being attentive to the other languages that are present in this life world of my family. Mm, fantastic. Um, I'm conscious of the time, so just a few more comments. And there's lots of questions and comments coming in, so I think we'll be continuing continuing this discussion um, more informally, probably over the coming months before you come to, to the west of Ireland, Kelly. Um, just one comment there from Martina Heinen, um, who's also working on a kind of a, a research creation project as well in terms of places of birth uh, in Ireland. Um, and she was wondering, what are your plans for kind of getting your work out there in terms of dissemination or are you thinking of, you know, publications or in a virtual form or how, how have you been thinking about that um, mm -hmm. as part of an outcome of, of your research? Thank you, Martina. Um, I've thought about that, too, because I haven't published uh, I haven't published any of the sections of my dissertation. Um, I would be really interested in um, creating a book.
that's when I think of the project, I think of it as a book, uh, but that will take some time. So in between, it would be interesting to possibly publish um, a version of finished version of normal exceptions, uh, perhaps in an oral history journal, it would be interesting to start exploring the different venues because my work is interdisciplinary so it could find a home in oral history, uh, nonfiction. Um, but I realize every time I present this work, what a vital part of it um, is formed by the oral history, the audio clips, and those do not make it into a written dissertation. So that's something I'm still wondering about. I'm not sure if I'm, well, I'd have to check with my family if they're comfortable with the idea of a website. A lot of uh, doctoral students will have a website that they make that accompanies their doctoral project. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's something we'd like to do, but it mm -hmm. might just be that it's something that that I'm able to share when I present this project live and it might, might only exist that way. Yeah. Well, we, we, we're very grateful for you for sharing the kind of the stage of the research that you are at and the, the writing process as well. And we look very much forward to welcoming you physically and in person rather than being in virtual Galway as we are today, but also to welcoming you um, to the Centre for Irish Studies and to the Moore Institute at NUI Galway when you do finally arrive on our shores um, as the Irish Studies Scholar next year, which would be wonderful. Um, uh, merci à vous, uh, Barbara aussi. Uh, it was fantastic to have you here with us Barbara again and to see you again on the zoom screen um but for your 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 framing of the, the different ways to approach Kelly's work and I think it has a large resonance and much work as we had discussed before in a different context um while there's a lot of interest of the Irish story abroad there's also a lot of interest of the kind of the diaspora coming back to Ireland as well and making those reconnections um in a way that Kelly was talking about at the start of her of her project as well um and in many ways it's reaffirmed the idea that we are an island nation, a transnational nation on the edge of Europe, but really at the centre of the world, um, and also that our stories are shared by the global Irish diaspora in, in many, many contexts internationally as well, um, and other migrant contexts within Ireland now as well too. Um, so I just want to thank you both very much uh, for being with us this afternoon. Um, and for coming to join us from Montreal time to Galway time. Um, we will be most definitely continuing this conversation over the years to come. Um, and also want to thank all of the attendees as well to all of these lectures that we've had live um, in recent months on Zoom via the, the Moore Institute and Centre for Irish Studies as well. Um, just to say, uh, we're just so delighted that Kelly was with us today and also Barbara because it, ex it exemplifies in many ways uh, what we were trying to do this year in Irish Studies, which which is opening up a space for new and emerging voices in the field. Um, it's been a very difficult year to be a graduate st uh, studies student. It's been a very difficult year to be an artist and a writer. And um, so it was part of our kind of our mission really in many ways to, to create a space um, for this work to get out there to a more global audience as well. Um, and finally, by having Barbara with us as well, it's it was highlighting the foregrounding, the value of understanding the Irish story, but from international perspectives and looking at the connections that are made um, of transnational lives and the Irish abroad and the interconnections that are there as well in so many ways. And having insights from scholars from different disciplines, sharing their ideas with us in so many different ways. So thank you both so much for being with us. Thank you, our attendees. And um, we shall see you all hopefully sometime in September when we resume um, our, our series again for the next academic year. Um, and finally, a special thanks to colleagues in uh, the Moore Institute, uh, Mr. David Kelly and Professor Dan Carey again uh, for, uh, for co-hosting these events and for all colleagues at NUI Galway as well. So merci et uh, we welcome you back next year. Eslan Anish. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you so much. Um, bye.